Good to see you this evening. Hope you've had a good day. We're going to say the books of the Bible, have some songs, and we've got the puppets with us tonight. We've got Jessica and Charlie, and we'll hear from them here in just a little bit. We're going to say 66 books in the Bible, 39 old, 27 new. That's easy to remember. 66, 66, 66 books of the Bible, 39 old, 27 new, 66 books of the Bible. Here, let's go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Now let's get the new. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. What else? 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. All right. Let's start out with uh, two magic words and then we'll sing another one. Ready? There are two little magic words that will open any door with ease. One little word is thanks, and the other little word is please. Anytime somebody does something for you that's nice, you ought to say thank you. And if you want to ask for something, may I do this please, or may I do that, please? All right, now what about this one about the devil being after us? You know that one, ready? One, two, three, the devil's after me. Four, five, six, he's always throwing bricks. Seven, eight, nine, he misses every time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, I'm free. Nine, eight, seven, I'm on my way to heaven. Six, five, four, there's room for many more. Three, two, one, the devil's on the run. Hallelujah, hallelujah, I'm free. All right, let's hear from Charlie and Jessica tonight. See what they might tell us, and we'll see what kind of lesson we can learn from what they say. What about it, Charlie and Jessica? Hey, what do you got there? It's a balloon. 
I know it's a boy and silly. Why are you bringing it to church? Oh, I was just so excited about the celebration today. Celebration? Is it someone's birthday? No. Wedding? No. Uh, graduation? Nope. Oh, I know, I know. It's a Groundhog Day, isn't it? Uh, not even close. If it's no birthday, wedding, graduation, or holiday, then what kind of celebration is it? It's a celebration to praise God, and I just was so excited I wanted to, wanted to bring this balloon to remind everyone. To, to remind them of what? Well, my balloon is big, just like the love of God is for us, and it's red to remind us that His Son, gave, Son Jesus gave His life for us. And, it, and it's got the string here on it. And what is the string for? The string is to tie around my wrist, wrist so I won't forget it. So your balloon is big like God's love, it's red to remind you of Jesus, and it has a little string to tie around your wrist so you won't forget it? That's right. We won't ever forget that God loves us. Always. Always? Always. Even when you don't clean your room? Always. Even when you forget to brush your teeth and we have stinky breath? Always. Even when you forget to put up your Play-Doh and it gets smushed into the carpet and makes a stain, then the dog thinks it's food and starts licking the carpet and turns it into a slobbery mess of pink and purple Play-Doh and it's really, really gross? Always. Wow, that is something to celebrate. I think I want a balloon too. I, here, I have an extra one just for you. Wow, thanks. Now remember, it's just, it's big, just like God's. Oh no, I forgot. Maybe the boys and girls can help. Let's see, it's big, just like God's. Love. And it's right to remind us that God gave us. Jesus. And it, and it has this little string to tie around my wrist, so I never. Forget. Wow, you guys are really smart. Now when you say your prayer tonight, be sure to thank God for, all, for his love and for Jesus. Bye. Well, girls and boys, that was really good from Charlie and Jessica. And we always do want to remember that God loves us. And He cares about us. And He wants us to live so we can go to heaven. He wants us to live so we can go to heaven with Him. Well, and we also want to be always very thankful that He sent Jesus to come to help us live so we can have a home in heaven. Now, you just remember that the best way you can if you have to have a little string around your finger or something, but you remember that God does love you and you remember what Jesus has done for us. Now, let's talk about the five finger prayer since they've talked about God's love. We want to always remember to talk to God in prayer every day. And we ought to at night when we go to bed. But we say every time the thumb represents those that are the closest to us. And we know who's closest to us. That's our family. Your father, your mother. You got a brother or sister. Could be your grandfather, your grandmother. But those that are real close to you, you need to pray for them and ask God to bless them. Always remember to do this. Ask God to give them a good health, good use of their mind and their bodies. They're trying to take care of you. They love you very, very much. And you need to pray for them. Now, we said also we need to pray for those in authority. Those in authority are people like the president. It's like the fire chief, the police chief, these people that they have a lot to do with what happens in our life. And the police, they're always trying to protect us from bad people. The fire people, the firemen, they're trying to help us if something catches on fire. They come in that big red truck and put the fire out. So you need to pray for them and ask God to bless them. And then pray for our leaders. That's those who are the elders in the church. I hope you know now, I keep telling you every week, who are our elders? Phil Sullivan, Jerry Cooper, and Tim Dickerson. You need to pray for them, ask God to bless them so that they can do a good job trying to shepherd the flock. That means to help take care of the church so that we'll go to heaven. And then, we need to pray for those that are weak. Those are the folks that are sick. Charlie, has there ever been anybody in your family sick? Not that I can think of. Not right now though, huh? But maybe sometime. Jessica, what about you? Uh, not right now. Not right now, but sometime. Mm -hmm. Well, when people are in your family are sick, you need to pray for them, don't you? Yes. That's right. Ask God to bless them and help them get well. 
Well, we need to pray for those people that are sick, and people that have to take treatments and things like that. And who's the last one we say every time that we ought to pray for? Me. Now, who is me? That is you. That's every little child. Charlie, Jessica, all the little children. And ask God to bless you, help you grow up and be a good boy and girl. And hopefully as you grow up, you become a Christian so you can live with God forever one day. You need to thank God for your food. Always before you eat, you need to say your prayers when you go to bed and ask God to bless you and protect you from all kinds of things, storms, all kinds of stuff. And then when you wake up in the morning, thank him for blessing you and ask him to watch over you through the day. But always remember to say your prayers for yourself. Okay, let's sing two more little songs and then uh, we will stop. Let, let's sing the song about Let's sing the song about the wise man again. So we'll be wise. And we will be wise if we love and obey the Lord. That's the wisest ones. Let's sing about the wise man. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the wise man's house stood firm. Oh, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. Foolish man built his house upon the sand. Foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down, and the floods came up. Rains came down, and the floods came up. Rains came down, and the floods came up, and a foolish man's house went splat. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessings will come down. Oh, the blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's sing the song about Sunshine Mountain. I just love that song. And we want to have a good attitude every day when we get up and have a good attitude through the day. That's why Jesus wants us to live. Ready? Climb, climb up, sunshine mountain, heavenly breezes blow. Climb, climb up, sunshine mountain, faces all aglow. Turn, turn from sin and doubting, look to God on high. Climb, climb up, sunshine mountain, you and I. We hope you have a good week and be good boys and girls. Bye-bye.
Hello church family and uh, welcome to uh, our uh, evening service for the Amory Church of Christ. We're happy that you have, uh, have chosen to uh, use this time um, to, uh, in, in worship in your home to, uh, to use our stream as an aid in that. Uh, we're, we're excited to, to get to study the Bible with you for a few minutes. So um, it's Easter Sunday and, and uh, and we, we have uh, listened to a great sermon from Philip about how Jesus was different and, uh, and asking the question, you know, who is it that you're, that you're going to, to listen to in your life? Are you going to listen to those who, who, um, uh, who would lead you astray or are you going to listen to the, the author and the perfecter of your faith? I, I really enjoyed that this morning. I've been thinking about, you know, uh, the world, uh, a lot of the religious world thinks about or emphasizes the resurrection today. They, they emphasize the resurrection of Jesus and, and, uh, and I think that, that of course we understand that, that, that as Christians we, we are to think about the death, burial and the resurrection of Jesus every day and have it impact our lives and we're to emphasize that that impact that it has in our lives every Sunday when we partake of the Lord's Supper and and uh, and when we remember so so but 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 as the as the world is is uh, is turning its mind uh, towards Christ and towards his resurrection this week uh, uh, a very uh, good brother in Christ and a friend of mine uh, shared something uh, on Facebook yesterday that got my wheels to turning. He talked about uh, he talked about the Sabbath before uh, that first day of the week, before the third day when Jesus rose again. And and uh, I've been thinking about that. And and uh, and uh, as I was th thinking this past week about what I wanted to say tonight, I I'd been thinking about the resurrection, and and I loved the way he put it. And and it got my wheels to turning in a different direction than what than where I was going to begin with. Sometimes that happens when, when you're a preacher and you see something really good. Your will, you know, it sparks a, a, a thought uh, process in your head. And I, I just want to share with you a couple of words. This is from a uh, good brother in Christ, Michael Whitworth. And he says, he says, I've always wondered what that Sabbath must have been like for the apostles. The Sabbath following the burial of Jesus in the tomb. It's over must have haunted each of their minds. Three years of following their rabbi throughout Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. It's over. Now what? At least as far as the Gospels tell us, none anticipated seeing their Lord again. Imagine their emotions, bitterness, hopelessness, loneliness, guilt, and shame. Oh, how I wish just one had had the faith to bring a lawn chair to the tomb, some popcorn, a stack of magazines, a countdown timer set for the third day. How I wish just one apostle had been so full of faith that he anticipated the certainty of the resurrection like kickoff for the Super Bowl. I wish just one had done so that I might increase my own faith. Now, he goes on and, and makes several really good points throughout the rest of that uh, little article that he shared. But I, I took that snippet and I wanted, to, I wanted to, to talk to you for a few minutes about where my mind went as I read those things. I wanted to talk to you for a few minutes about where my, uh, where my thoughts had, had strayed to. And I was thinking about the times that, that Jesus appeared to the disciples after the resurrection. Of course, you, you have uh, just about every account where 
where the, the, the ladies come with their spices and their, and their, and their perfumes to, to prepare uh, the body of Jesus and to, and to, uh, and to uh, honor his body in that way and they find the empty tomb. And, and so then they, they run uh, to, to the apostles and, and Peter and John both run to the tomb and we have that great, uh, that great picture that John writes about where John lets everybody know he was faster than Peter and he gets there to the tomb. But Peter walks in and, and he sees the face cloth of Jesus laying there but, but no Jesus. And, and, uh, and they were astonished. They were astounded. Um, and so John picks up with this account uh, right, right there. Um, I'm sorry, Luke picks up with this account. My, my fault. Uh, Luke picks up with this account and says, That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back, saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What is, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into this glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Now I read all of that to, to, give, you, um, to give you a little bit of context as to what's about to happen. It says they rose that same hour. Well, it says they, they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures? They rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So there, there is an opportunity, you know, uh, we're going we're gonna to focus in on Peter here and the, and the opportunity of times that he had to see Jesus after the resurrection, but before he decided he was going to go fishing. You know, sometimes uh, in our lives, um, faith can be an issue. Uh, faith can, can be an issue when, when we start thinking about, you know, what about my relationship with, with Jesus? Is it real? Is, is Jesus someone I can put my faith in? You know, I've, I've, uh, I've never seen Jesus. I've never met Jesus. I've never... I don't know anybody who has met Jesus. I've never... Um, you know, I've never seen a miracle, although I've read about several of them. I've never seen, you know, things that, 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 would, that would help bolster my faith. You know, and if only I could read, you know, like, like, like Michael said, in his, like Mr. Whitworth said in his status there, if only I could read about an apostle who had faith enough to wait by the tomb, who had faith enough to understand, okay, he's going to rise on the third day. If only, I, if only I could read about someone like that, but sadly, there isn't that. 
But I find comfort in that as well, and, and I'm going to explain that here in a minute. So it says that he's appeared to Simon there. Now we don't know if, uh, if, if Simon is Simon Peter in this story on the road to Emmaus. It says that they went and found the eleven and those who were gathered with them. So, si so Simon Peter would have been one of those eleven. There's speculation about that, but, but it doesn't matter because verse 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. They were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do, your, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him fish. Luke, Luke goes into a little more detail, but I want you to flip with me to John towards the end. Listen to, listen to what happens here. So this is for sure one time that, it, that Jesus has appeared where Peter is present, possibly two if Simon is Simon Peter <clears throat> on the road to Emmaus. Watch this. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them, said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were, were glad that they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, verse 24, one of the twelve called the twin was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. He said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and, and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to them, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see, uh, this, is, this is for sure two times that Peter has seen the Lord possibly four times if the account in Luke is different than what, than what John records here. We're not certain about that. But it's at least two times that Jesus has seen the Lord. So why is it that in chapter 21, and, and, and I, would, I would give this as a possibility. We don't know for sure. The Gospels don't tell us this. But in chapter 21 of John it says, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Verse 2 says, Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, Well, we will go with you. They went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And so uh, Jesus comes to them and, and calls out to them and says, Cast your nets on the other side. And then it, it is then that, that, that John or, or the disciple who Jesus loves says, It is the Lord. And, uh, and, and Peter gets so excited that he just jumps out of the boat and swims to shore. And, and so, so there's this... Uh, there's this awesome uh, account and encounter. And so, so this is a, at least the third time that Jesus has appeared to Peter since the resurrection. But, but I, want to, I want to frame something in, in this way for a second. Let's go back to, to that first day of the week, the day of resurrection. Pete, Peter meets meets the women on the road and, and they're seeking them out and they say, the tomb's empty. He's gone. He runs to the tomb, although he doesn't beat John there. He runs to the tomb and he goes inside and he sees the face cloth and he believes. 
Their faith is strengthened. Then he at least hears an account. If he, if he isn't there himself, he hears an account of disciples who are on the road to Emmaus. People who love Jesus and they encounter him. He teaches them. Their eyes are opened. And so they bring that account to the, to the disciples, to the apostles, to the eleven. And while, while, that's being, while, while that's being talked about, while they're talking about these things, Jesus is right there in the room and Peter sees him. Jesus explains some things to him. They feed him a meal. We don't know that if that, that we don't know if that's the same account that John gives of them being all in a room for fear of the Jews. But he he appears to them then, and then eight days later he appears to him again, or appears to the the apostles again, for Thomas's sake. So why is it that Peter decides a little later on? We don't know how much later on, but why is it that? Peter decides, well, I'm, I'm going to go fishing. Was it doubt? Was it this feeling of, of shame? Because he knew, he knew that he had denied his Lord. This sense of not belonging because of, because of that weakness of faith. Or was it was it confusion? Yes, he had seen the Lord, but, but what was going to happen next? He had seen the Lord, but, but it was only for a brief time, and, and it was only brief times every time he had seen the Lord. Why, why wasn't Jesus restoring the kingdom to Israel? Why, wasn't, why weren't the prophecies as he interpreted them being fulfilled and so maybe Peter decided, I'm going to go back to what I know until something's made clearer to me. I'm going to go back to what I know until, until, something is, is, until something clicks, until something comes together. I don't know. The gospel doesn't clarify that for us. Uh, John doesn't go into detail. He just says that Peter says, I'm going fishing. And the rest of them say, well, we'll go with you. But think about this. Peter had seen Jesus at least two and possibly four times leading up to, uh, to this particular encounter uh, while he was fishing. But sometimes I feel bad about, about my lack of faith. You see, I think that, that the things in the Gospels are written for a reason. They're written for our, for our deeper understanding. They're written for us to, to, to build our own faith because while we can't see Jesus in person, we have the accounts of those who have and those who did, those who walked with Him. And, and they were struggling with the idea of a risen Christ. They were struggling with the idea of a resurrection. They were struggling with the idea that, that the prophecies could now be fulfilled now that Jesus had been crucified. They didn't understand what it was that Jesus was talking about when He said, tear this temple down and I'll build it again in three days. They didn't understand what Jesus said when He would plainly say to them, I'm going to rise again on the third day. They were struggling with the idea of the resurrection of Jesus. So why is it so far-fetched that Abel struggles with that idea sometimes too? Why is it so far-fetched that you and I struggle, about, or struggle with these things or are confused about these things, but it's so wonderful to know that Jesus did what was necessary to restore their faith? You read the interaction between Jesus and Peter towards the end of, of, of chapter 21 there. It's so beautiful. Simon, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Simon, do, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Simon, do you love me? Tend my sheep. 
it's so beautiful to think about uh, to think about the links that Jesus was was going to for his apostles there for them to understand what was coming for them to understand the plan for them to understand the hope that they now had because of a risen Christ so no while we don't have a perfect picture of of of, a, of an apostle who had enough faith to wait by the tomb we do have a perfect picture of a risen Savior who loved me enough to give me accounts like this so that so that I know when my faith struggles I can look at their examples I can look at the apostles and I can say okay they struggled too and here's how they overcame it with a firm deep love and commitment to Jesus. Have you made that commitment yourself? Is your relationship with God where it needs to be? If it's not tonight, I hope that, that you would do what's necessary to make that right, whether that means that, that you need to start a relationship with God, that you need to become a Christian, uh, putting to death the old man of sin through baptism, or, uh, and then rising again, like, like we've talked about, the resurrection, rising again, a, a, new, a new creature, a new creation, dedicated to the will of God in your life. If you've done that, and perhaps... Your, your faith has, has sputtered a little bit. Perhaps your faith is, is, is wavering a little bit. Perhaps you're confused like Peter possibly was and you're, and you're waiting for something big, some big God thing to happen in your life. Perhaps all that's necessary is for you to take that step of faith. For you to, to, to come back, uh, renew your commitment to God, renew your faith in Him. Let us, let us pray with you and for you and encourage you as a church family. The Lord's invitation is always open. Philip and I are always available to talk to anyone who, who needs the prayers of the congregation or needs encouragement. We love you and, and, uh, and we're so, uh, so excited about the future here at the Amory Church of Christ. We're so excited about... Uh, the things that we have coming up, our gospel meeting and, and things that, that, are, that are going to, to serve as, as a means to encourage us to, to, uh, to renew uh, our relationship with God. I hope that you'll do that this week and I hope that you'll take active steps this week to be better than you were before. We love you so much. We thank you. Have a great week, guys. Thank you.